what to do before the vet arrives. Basically preparing the individual for the definitive care that the veterinarian will give it when they get there. So we're discussing horse injuries, how they seem to be mystical creatures in their ability to sustain injury in the most bizarre ways. Um, obvious ones are when they get trapped in structures, barbed wire, nails, uh, farm equipment if they get out and start running around, and then down branches, down trees, trees or branches that mystically appear in the side of the horse when there's nothing nearby that they could have gotten into, or running in corn stubble and, and getting that sort of thing embedded in their hooves or their soles. Tetanus vaccine, make sure it's up to date because there's nothing worse than showing up and the horse is already starting to look rigid. People used to have tetanus a lot more when we had horses running around because of course they're pooping out the Clostridium tetani that causes it. Legs, they like to hurt their legs a lot. They're flight creatures. They will run from things, they will run into things, farm equipment, building materials. Hay nets, I'm not a super big fan of them. There was a stud in the barn where my husband trains and for whatever reason, they, they really like the hay nets and he got his leg caught up in there and all uh, torn up from that. Kicks, when they're out with their friends in the paddock and there's always the potential for broken bones there. So we always have to be very careful around them when we think they've had a kick. And of course, because they're out in a paddock or they're standing around where they poop, there's always the chance for dirt and manure to get in. And specifically on the lower limbs, it's difficult for them to heal those things that are far down from their hock and their, their knee. Sole punctures, we will talk about, and eyes, but they also like to um, get hung up on things with their eyes. And that's, that can be a very challenging one for owners to see for sure. So how much blood is too much blood? So a 500 kilogram horse has about 40 liters of blood in it, or about 10 gallons. And a horse can lose eight to 10 liters, or two gallons of blood before showing signs of shock. And shock would be when it is not responding to you properly, it's not getting enough oxygen to its brain, it's looking a little glassy in the eye, coldness in the extremities, just bizarre sort of behaviors. Graphic demonstration for you, this is the volume of blood a horse can lose. That's a lot of blood. So it can be coming out fast, but you can see I'm already getting a big puddle of blood in here, and this is just gonna keep on going, and we can lose this much blood before the animal goes down and we have problems with them. A human, this might be, for some of the smaller women in the room, this is much blood as you have in your entire body. Somebody like me, I have a bit more, but um, <laughs> so we, uh, we would have exsanguinated by now. So another way of visualizing that or, or thinking about it, it would be two full milk bags of the four liter milk bags. So it's hard to remain calm in these situations. You go in, your best friend has just lacerated or cut its eye on something in the stall they could have a hunk of skin hanging down. It's distressing for most of us to see that sort of stuff, but you flip a switch, you, you try and be calm because you are the one who is gonna save this individual. You get to be the superhero for the day. You have to determine whether they're able to walk and whether they're lame at the walk or not lame because like I said, they could have a broken bone in there if they've been kicked. So you don't want to move them if they've got a broken bone unless it's, uh, they're in a bad area. You want, if you can, to lead them to a quiet, clean area for beginning the triage on this wound. And you would like it to be sheltered and then you call your vet. If they're not able to get up, so it's that horse that's under the fence and you have to tear part of the fence down before you can get them up out of there, then that's what you do. You keep them down on the ground, you get somebody to sit on their head if they can safely, protect their eyes from the sun and if they are out in the sun in the middle of summer, you want to try and get some shade over top of them if that's possible. And in the winter, you wanna make sure they've got a blanket on them so that they don't become distressed from the, the heat or the cold. And then the next steps, of course, depend on the wound type. And, and each situation is going to be different, but I'm going to give you some very basic things that you can do. 
We have to talk about wound types, and the first ones are when we have a cut that's right through the entire skin. So you're all the way down to muscle, potentially down further to bone. A slice is like a knife cut. So that's going to have smooth edges. A laceration technically has jagged edges, and that has implications for when, you're, when the vet is trying to sew it up later. When they're trying to put the stitches in, jagged is not as easy as smooth. Punctures, so obviously when we jab a stick in there or a nail or whatever other object they manage to get in there, that can have big damage. And you gotta think about it, they're standing around in poop and something that acts like a hypodermic needle is being jammed up in there and it's full of bacteria. So we're always going to assume that these types of injuries very specifically are going to be infected. Like I said, these three types all go all the way through the skin. And then we want to see if there's profuse bleeding. So if it's arterial, it's going to be like a jet of blood pulsing out of the animal. If it's venous, it's going to be a little slower. If it's a big bore uh, vessel like the jugular vein, which is about the size of a garden hose, if that gets cut, then they will bleed more profusely than a smaller vein. Abrasions, they can look pretty bad. It's surface damage only, like skinning a knee when you fell off your bike when you were a kid. Tools that we have, we can have bottles of sterile saline. We can have these little guys of sterile saline. I like to have an 18 gauge needle, and I'll show you why I like to have that. 60 cc syringe can help, especially around the eyes. We'll talk about that specifically. And then even if you're on a well, Cold water hosing can very much help. That will clean the wound to the best of your ability as in a first aid situation, as well as providing some coolness to that area to help prevent swelling. So tool modifications, what we can do, if we have that 18 gauge needle, and very carefully, you can bend the needle back and forth. You keep it in the protective covering here Bend it back and forth until such time as you break it off. Once you break it off, leave it in there. You are never going to expose yourself to that sharp end and put it in your sharps container that you would have in your barn. Because this becomes very useful for doing lavage, particularly around eyes, washing out dirt from around the eyes and stuff like that. Because you don't want to have a needle. You've got a sharp object pointing at it, and that doesn't work very well in many situations. This is the stream of water that I managed to generate full force, and it's kind of a, a piddly little stream coming from the 60cc syringe. We can see that I ha this is much stronger. It's got higher pressure because it's coming through the, the remainder of that 18 gauge needle. So I like to do that one if I'm lavaging around eyes or even some wound types. Okay, bad bleed. What to do before the vet arrives? An absorbent pad or a towel. So people have been talking about diapers. We haven't mentioned the unmentionables, <laughs> ladies. Um, these are very good. And you can have things like this on hand. If it's an absorbent cotton type, this one feels like it might not be uh, natural fiber, but something like that you can have on hand. These kind of pee pads from small animal puppies uh, in house training. And then you want to bandage it tightly in place. If it bleeds through, don't remove the bandage. You leave what you've put on there, you add another layer to it, tape that on. And you keep doing that until no more blood comes through. We don't like to use a tourniquet unless the veterinarian, unless you say, I think I've got a femoral artery going, they probably wouldn't want you to place a tourniquet because that can cause tissue damage. It deprives the rest of the tissue of oxygen and so on and so forth. So, uh, and for those who haven't seen one, this is a human dummy, uh, probably simulating, I don't know, gunshot wound or something. And so they've got a tourniquet here and that just stops the blood flow through that major vessel so they're not exsanguinating on the table. But we don't like to do that unless absolutely necessary. So just keep applying those absorbent layers. Now, if this one is not bleeding too badly, you can see there's the fetlock, there is the pastern there, and 
there's blood and it looks terrible, but remember how much blood we could be losing and that is actually not bad. So this is one that you can clean the dirt away with the saline flush. With those bottles, you can poke holes in the lid of the bottle in a sterile manner and you can squirt it like this. You can use this bag and squirt it. I won't do that. I'll put it up so it doesn't dribble everywhere. <laughs> Um, you can use the 60cc syringe. It will take you a lot longer though, so if it's a smaller wound, that might be more appropriate, and of course around the eyes. And using that broken off needle tip technique is helpful. And once it's clean, we go back to think of the three layer bandages. What are the three layers? What's the first layer? Telfa is a good one to start with. I read a lot of websites when I was putting this together, and even one veterinary website said use Vaseline. We don't ever want to use Vaseline the Telfa is good because you're not going to mess things up for the vet when they show up. And the next layer is what? The gauze to hold that in place and then the padding. So yes, the gommage as they call it. We can open this up later and look at it. Uh, but gommage looks like this stuff basically, this cotton sheeting type absorbent pad. Or you can use a thinner product like a bandage. And then the third layer, of course, is the vet wrap and so on. So abrasions, these are a little more easy. They can look dramatic. Uh, you, the horse goes down on its knees for whatever reason. Clean away the dirt, saline flush, et cetera. Cold water hose is very good for this because you will help prevent the swelling that comes up with those. And then when the vet comes out, they're going to look and see what else they can remove from that, like gravel, bits of stone, and look for any punctures because, of course, this is very limited amount of skin. The joint is very close to the surface and it doesn't take much to penetrate that joint capsule and then you're fighting a knee infection. If they're kicked, how lame are they? Can they walk? Are they just hiding the pain from you? Uh, the adrenaline, like we were talking about yesterday, I keep thinking about six bells winning that race and then um, having a fractured pastern, I think it was. That it's still so chilling to me at this point. How lame are they? They might not be able to walk until the vet places a splint, like a Kimsey splint or something like that. And then think about shade or warmth. You don't need them to have this become a complicated situation by becoming overheated or too cold. So this is a kick wound on the inner aspect of the hock. So I know it looks like the outside, but it actually is at the back. This is the calcaneus or the, the heel of the horse there. And this is quite, has been penetrated to quite some depth. It could be communicating with the tendon sheath here or even into some of the joint structures more deeply. So we as first aiders do not go probing around in that wound. We clean it as best we can, apply the bandage, and then wait for the vet to arrive to look into that wound and see what's going on. When it's a stick or a nail, I'm just talking about on the body, on the limbs. I'm not talking about the sole specifically at this point. Take photos of how it's located because it might fall out and the vet's going to need to know a bunch of angles to try and determine what angle it went in and what it might be interfering with. Try not to pull it out of the wound. It's case by case, obviously, whether you do pull it out you may not be able to let them walk back home on a nail that keeps getting pushed further and further into their soul. So depending on the location, I always think of the first aid that you receive for human first aid. If there's like a knife sticking out of the thigh, you can make a donut bandage around that and bandage that into place. So the object is sticking up like that. You put a donut bandage around it like that and, and secure that into place so that the the physician can, can uh, remove that knife and see what's going on. So donut bandages, you get a cloth, they're pretty easy. You make a little loop around your fingers, sort of the diameter of the object, or a bit bigger, and then you just keep looping and looping and looping. And it's kind of tedious to sit there and watch this process, so I'm not going to do the entire thing. But um, you end up with quite a strong and rigid structure that will prevent that knife or whatever, that stick, from moving around and making hamburger of the muscle underneath. So the vet will arrive and finish dealing with that for you. 
So here's a sole puncture. This, this horse uh, is actually alive. I know it looks maybe like a post-mortem shot, but they've just cropped out all the other detail. This horse had been out on the trail. You can see there's manure here, there's dirt from the trail, and then there's the nail here. So what can be done with that, you can bandage around the whole hoof if you don't have any other thing to help keep the hoof elevated or in some instances you may actually have to pull it out. But it's case by case, so you'll have to see how it is going. It's helpful to leave it in because we can see radiographically on x-rays where it's going. This has missed the navicular bursa, but this is probably penetrating the deep digital flexor tendon sheath at the very least there. So if possible, you can put blocks on there and tape those into place, or you can use hard foam as you would use for lily pads on a laminitic horse. They just have to be taller than the nail, and then that allows that nail to stay in place or that foreign object to stay in place until the vet arrives so that they can see what structures might be involved and they can take x-rays of that. And then you want to keep them on clean, deep bedding, keep it nice and poofy and soft for them. So here is an example of what you might do. So this is the foam material. It's hard enough dense enough to support their weight. You would cut out a little piece that would go around the nail here and then tape it into place like that just before the vet arrives. And then they can look after that definitively. They might not appreciate quite so much duct tape in their way, but uh, <laughs> I was gonna say this is not my favorite image because they've gone over the coronary band, they've gone over the heel bulbs and it's probably um, not gonna be great. It, it won't stay in place like that, that's for sure, because you'll cause problems with the heel bulbs and the bulbs in the coronary band. The vet might say okay to using Chlorhex or Savlon, but on the whole, don't do any of this until they tell you to use this material. That's more for them to use judiciously, and we can see what can, we'll see in an upcoming presentation what problems can ensue when this does get used inappropriately. Things absolutely not, no, never, no, no how. Hydrogen peroxide kills things. It's not okay. It will kill the delicate little tissues. It will kill the delicate little cells that are trying to grow in and fix things. It will kill the tissue and you'll end up with a worse problem. Rubbing alcohol, definitely not. So none of those. Mm -hmm.